Welcome to, this, to today's Spotlight about humanizing education. We are very really excited to have all of you here with us today. Before we start, I want to inform you that we are recording this session. Please switch off on your cameras as you wish. And we would also like the participants to introduce themselves in the chat. Tell us who you are, where you're from, and what you do. Please mute yourselves when you are not speaking and feel free to use the reaction buttons. I know our speaker, um, he likes an interactive session, so feel free to comment or ask questions in the chat. Our 15, 15 minute spotlights are packed with a warm welcome, content delivery and an interactive Q&A session. So don't be shy to get those questions into the chat. Now I'm gonna introduce you to our facilitator now. Mark Sparvel is the Global Education Director at Microsoft. He's a keynote speaker, a writer, a podcaster, a principal, and a global leader. It is a great honor for me to welcome him to share his expertise and knowledge about humanizing education to contribute to transforming self and others as educators. I hand over to you, Mike. Mark. <laughs> Unmute myself. And you should hear me loud and clear right now and be able to see the slide. A thumbs up is always appreciated. Hi, thanks for that, Mike. Hi, everybody. Welcome from Buenos Aires through to London, who are joining us here on the call. I'm delighted to be with you today to join the T4 community and talk about how we can leave a technology thoughtfully to humanize learning. As Jasmine said at the start, let's be active on the chat. I'll have mine open on one of these thousands of screens I've got in front of me. So if at times I appeared a little bit distracted, I'm working from my bedroom in Kirkland, Washington, just across the lake from Seattle, coming to you live, well, sort of live right now. I've been involved in education for 30 years in many different roles from teacher, principal, that person who fixed your printer in your classroom, um, a sloppy academic working in universities, a director in professional associations. And as Jasmine noted, my current role is a director, a global director of education for Microsoft, um, working across the globe with schools and systems. You can see on the screen, I'm connected with a bunch of other organizations as well. Groups like the Emotional Intelligence Society of Australia that I'm an ambassador for. I'm a friend of Goldie Horn's Mind Up Foundation, who have been working in the space of well-being for close on 20 years. The local obviously, is, is that correct? Obviously involved with T4 this as a judge when the logo. of the Global Best Schools Prize. And I founded and I run the Cell and Edu community, the links on the screen, uh, that has around about 25,000 educators in there and certainly invite you to uh, to join that community. Now, we've already done a quick intro in the room. If you haven't, please use the text chat and uh, pop in there to let me know where you're from and what your role is. I can see a lot of you have done that already. And thank you for that. Welcome to Jordan. Great to see you in the room. Welcome to Donna in the US here. I've mentioned Buenos Aires. We've got a bunch of people from London, Malaysia joining us. So great that you're here. There's a reason why I called out those people just then. More on that in just a second. So the plan for today is I'm going to talk briefly about the compelling case for social and emotional learning, benefits, approaches that work based upon 30 years of positive psychology. I'm going to touch on the role technology plays um, broadly, not specifically to do with Microsoft, but some of those examples will be things like Minecraft or flip free tools. Um, I'll share out some resources and obviously allow Q&A at the end. I guess consider this to be an introduction and an invitation. It's an introduction to how I'm thinking, we're thinking about the role technology can play moving forwards. And it's an invitation for you to follow up with me directly afterwards, follow me up on Twitter, social, or through T4. So this is invitation. 
if I was going to start at the end, I'd start with my closing comment, which would have been this. The greatest potential that we have with technology is to humanise learning and not just to digitise the content. And when we've surveyed students across the globe, they've been very clear. They don't want their learning to be automated. They do want autonomy, but they don't want automation. For them, the students themselves, the relationship between themselves and their teacher is at the heart of their learning. Technology in education has been around a lot longer than a lot of people think. In fact, 80 years. You can see on the slide at the moment, examples through the decades of where technology has entered the classrooms, depending obviously upon where in the world you are. It might be that overhead projectors, photocopiers are still the number one technology used. And as we know during COVID, we lent back again on things like radio and TV from Uruguay to Amazonia to other places to help deliver continuity of learning. So this isn't a continuum of bad to best. It's just noting technologies being levered. And when you look at those in certain ways to communicate, to distribute. Here's what I think when I think about technology. I think about what it is that every person, if, if our aim is that, um, that every learner is able to maximise their full potential in learning, in life, in work, they need some fundamental things. If we want learners to be motivated, to work, to persist, to pursue, they need to be seen, they need to be heard, they need to have a sense of belonging, and they need to feel that they have the capacity to contribute their skills, their knowledge, their ideas to the world. So just think about that for a moment when you think about technology. My question to myself is always, does technology help every learner have voice, have choice? Does it give them agency? Does it give them a sense of control? Does it give them the best seat in the house? And that might be one-to-one -one if you're in an affluent economy. It might be one device to many kids. And sometimes it'll be no technology. But every kid wants to be seen and heard and belong and contribute. And when I've listened to students across the globe over the last couple of years, the times and places where they felt least motivated, where they felt most disinclined to engage in learning is where they have not been seen or heard, listened to, they haven't felt a sense of connection and they haven't had an opportunity to contribute. So that all sounds good, but what does it look like, right? Here's how we think about the role technology can and should play right now. It's about making learning fairer for everyone. And I look at technology around, okay, can it accelerate learning? By that I mean, does it help kids keep up, catch up and get ahead, regardless of ability or disability, mobility or income, location or identity? Can every kid keep up, catch up, get ahead? And in a second, I'm gonna do a, a, a live demo. It'll be a disaster of a, a free tool which can sort of help with that. The other part is around, you know, how do we design learning environments that are really inclusive? We know that they've become more diverse as populations have moved through as a result of environmental causes, political causes, migration, immigration, refugees. How do we ensure we design learning environments that actively recognize and value the contributions of all and make every student feel like they have that voice and choice and that they have that agency and technology can reduce those barriers and those frictions. And the last piece, the really other critical piece we'll talk about in detail today is around how can it support well-being? Surely screen time is bad and they've had enough of that over the last couple of years. 
surely now is the time to close the lid of the device and focus on those human relationships. And I certainly wouldn't disagree with that, um, but I think there is an important role technology can play. Okay, this is gonna happen live. We're gonna do a quick live demo of a completely free tool. Uh, let's pick on the inclusively designed and then we'll move into the well-being. So just bear with me for an awkward moment um, because I am not the, whoops, I'm not the tech person uh, that you want to see uh, do a live demo, but I'm gonna do it because I think it's kind of a, a cool demo. So just give me a second and Mike or Jasmine, can you see that Word document on the screen? We can. Okay, so I've opened up Word. It's not grandma or grandpa's Word anymore. We all know this tool has been around forever. This is the live online version, which means it's completely free, obviously, like all of Office is free for every student and in every teacher in a qualifying institution. You can have it for free. That's kind of cool. I'm going to play around with the Dictate tool, which has been around for a long time sitting in Word, but it's very advanced now. So let's imagine that you were a student who you've come from an you're in an English speaking situation now, but you're a non-English speaker. Or let's imagine you're a student whose brain is going faster than their hands can keep up. You're a neurodiverse student, perhaps. Maybe you're a student who just lacks confidence. You're racked with anxiety and you've had to write this story. So if I click on the dictate button and I'll be asking Jasmine Mike to put a thumb up when they start to see words, I can just talk to my computer. So. Mark was feeling incredibly stressed because he had a presentation to deliver today and he wasn't feeling super organized and wasn't sure of the audience and it was early in the morning, but he got up, he had a shower, he put on his yellow t-shirt, orange, sorry, t-shirt, and he jumped right into it. So I know that there's nothing spectacular in that. I can go back and do a bit of editing. It runs on a neural network though, which means that it's making sense as it's typing. You might have noticed along the way that it was making subtle editorial changes to my writing. So that's interesting. That's not the wow bit. How do we make learning inclusive for everybody? Well, let's drop it into a free tool used by over 25 million people. It's available everywhere in Minecraft, in Word, in PowerPoint, in Outlook. It's available in Canva all places. It's called Immersive Reader. And I know some of you in the group know about this. Designed originally to support students with dyslexia or dyslexic thinking students, it's a benefit to any learner. So straight away, you can see that I can have it read to me. So that's handy, first of all, so I can listen back. Mark was feeling incredibly stressed because he had a presentation to deliver today. Okay, that's useful straight up. It's free, you don't need to buy this, okay. Um, what I can also do is if I hold my mouse over, you can see on the screen, Picture Dictionary pops up. Okay, so Picture Dictionary pops up to give me a sense of what that word is. Again, super handy if I'm learning a language. Okay, I can drop in, uh, if I'm focused on emotions, I can zoom into those. What does sorry look like? I can hear the word. Sorry. Sure, that's cool. What else can I do? Well, I could do obvious things like change the text size because I need to have, you know, larger text. Maybe I'm a dyslexic thinker and I need to change the background or I'm low vision and I need to make some changes to make this more comfortable for myself to be able to read. That's good. I could decrease or increase the spacing. You can see all of the visual clutter has been removed, certainly useful for uh, neurodiverse students who need more focus. Speaking of focus, what I can also do is turn on line focus mode and I can have the text read to me one line at a time or three lines at a time. Very cool. I've just come from another country because uh, uh, let's say I've, I've just moved into your classroom and I need to have this translated by word or by whole document into Danish and read in Danish. I can certainly do that too. Let's pop it back to English. I can also have it um, 
translate word by word or the entire thing. I'm going to put it to Australian English because it even pays attention whether English is Irish English, US English or Australian English, because believe it or not, as an Australian living in America, there's a cultural difference there. Plus, also, I can pull out things like all of the nouns or I can pull out the verbs helps me deconstruct that text. So this is immersive reader. It's a way that we give every learner the tools that they need to control the learning. It can help them with their writing, obviously, because they can listen to and edit live their own writing. And obviously, that helps them with their reading and their reading fluency. So I'm going to close that and we're back to the big slide, right? Look at that, a tech. We did a live demo right here, happening right now in real time with the person who is the world's worst at doing a technical demo, which is why I'm the best person to do it. Because 30 years in the classroom show me that I need to appear unflappable. So inclusively designed, you just had a quick look, but I'm going to spend the bulk of my time on this well-being section, and then we'll jump into the Q&A at the end. So Let's jump into it. A quick grounding, first of all, we hear a lot about words like well-being, social and emotional learning, social skills, competencies, transversal skills, skills for the future, 21 century skills. All of these are important. Social and emotional skills allow you to do things, and it's what they allow you to do that are important. And this is from the Collaborative uh, for the Assessment of Social and Emotional Learning their competencies, the skills allow you to make decisions that are responsible, to sustain and build positive relationships, to manage yourself and your emotions, to manage the emotions of others, and to develop critically the ability to recognise how external and internal factors are affecting how you're thinking and feeling, self-awareness. Let's do a quick emotion check-in on the text chat. My question to you is, how are you feeling today on the one to nine Chihuahua scale? So if you could all just pop a number in the text chat, are you feeling one all the way through up until nine? Which Chihuahua are you? Sandra's popped herself down um, for number three, which is awesome. Thank you for that, Sandra, for being number one. Mike's a, a number one, <laughs> watch out those teeth. Now, while you're popping those in, it's so funny, isn't it? Like it is, it entertains me greatly and it probably shouldn't entertain me every time that I use that, but it does. So apologies for that. Now I could have used some other forms of emotion check-ins, right? I could have used, uh, you know, how are, uh, you know, how, dog are you feeling i can't think of the name of that dog if you know you can pop it in the text chat uh, how william shakespeare are you feeling those sorts of things they're all all a uh, all different sort of ways of engaging in emotion check-in so why does that matter in a sense you've been neurohacked just in that moment in time laughter reduces the stress hormone cortisol it increases a little jot of serotonin um, and oxytocin, you get the hormones that bond us together. Um, it means that you like me a little bit more because I made you smile. Your body and your kids' bodies can't tell the difference between a fake smile and a fake laugh. Their bodies will react the same. It'll reduce stress, reduce heart rate. Propensity for laughter is identified by positive psychologists as one of the 24 main signature strengths. It essentially lowers your guard and it prepares you for something else. So in a sense, yeah, you have all just been neurohacked with a little bit of laughter. And emotion check-in matters for a number of reasons. It signals an intent that we've created a space for students to pause and think, catch their breath, take a breath, think about what's going on in their head and their heart, think about why that is, and then attempt to label that paying attention to what their bodies are telling them at that moment in time. Are my hands clenched? Are my shoulders tight? Am I slumped in the seat? 
Am I relaxed or am I primed for fight, flight or freeze? And the really important thing, if you look on the screen at the mood meter borrowed from Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, is that emotions can be organized by unpleasant to pleasant, neither good nor bad. There are no bad emotions. All emotions matter and they serve a purpose. And they're organized in each quadrant from low energy to high energy. You could ask students, what's your energy level like emotionally? Hmm, I'm feeling a little bit Mm, low. Okay. Is it pleasant or is it unpleasant? Uh, well, it's not unpleasant, but it's not really pleasant. Oh, so are you just feeling calm or relieved? Yeah, that's how I'm feeling. That's labeling emotions. And it's a fundamental step to developing emotional intelligence. Mark Brackett from the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence says it better than me when he says, you must be able to name it to tame it. So we must be able to develop the language of emotions. Now you can't see because of my beautiful blurred background in the video, but I'm wearing a Feeling Monsters t-shirt. More of those coming up in a moment, but make no mistake, whether you're a school leader, tuning into emotional intelligence could be considered a productivity hack. And as a classroom teacher, it's an important strategy right now to reduce stress in our students. Thank you, Feeling Monster, for your contributions to society today. Adults need to check in on cell two, every member of your staff, all of your teachers. No point having a great social and emotional learning program if leadership and if teachers themselves aren't tuned into it. Just going to flag for you just to, again, I've got no vested interest, nor does Microsoft in this, um, but uh, Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence partnered up with Pinterest. They've produced howwefeel.org. It's a free app available at the moment only on iOS, but will be released in Android. And it's a fairly phenomenal emotion check-in tool with strategies to support. So that's a quick commercial break. Why does that matter for adults? It matters because emotions are contagious. We catch them particularly from people in leadership positions. Uh, teachers catch them from their principals. Principals catch them from their superintendents. Students catch them from their students. Students catch them from their teachers. It could be a function of mirror neurons. That's that neuron setup that we all have in our brains that cause us to nod when other people nod. Or if you're standing next to a mother rocking a baby, you find yourself moving in rhythm. It's an evolutionary adaptation of humans to make us feel connected to one another. It's a domino effect. So emotions are caught by other people, both in obvious ways and also in very subtle ways, how we engage with them. Um, if you ask any group of teachers, you know, whether their emotional state affects how they see their students, they, statistically speaking, will tell you 100% of the time, absolutely no effect whatsoever. When I grade students' work, my emotions don't matter because I'm a teaching robot. Apparently not true. Um, in fact, in every time the study has been done over and over and over again, when teachers are put in a grumpy mood, um, they grade students harder. When teachers are put in a relaxed or positive mood, they grade students more accurately based upon moderation. There's the study on the screen. Um, but do teachers' emotions matter? Yes, they do. There's another famous study done by a Rosenthal and Babad back in the 1985, where they basically told a teacher that they'd done tests and four or five students in their class came up as being potentially high potential students. But because it was a clinical trial and the teachers were being observed for six months, they weren't to do anything at all different. If they did, then the whole study was over. So the teachers were really, really vigilant and didn't do anything different for those students. At the end of the six months, they were retested. And guess what? Those students were indeed high performing. But the surprise? probably you know this already, the surprise was they weren't. They were never special to begin with. In fact, they were picked because they were just average kids. 
the teachers didn't do anything different. Six months later, those students were exceptional. Huh. It's called micro affirmations. We can't help ourselves. Learning is a social process. This is why educators need to be ultra emotionally intelligent because we communicate all of the time to our students our expectations of them and what we believe to be their potential. Think about the flip side of that. Think about when we hold lower expectations, that subtle influence that has on student achievement. But the flip side happens. So let's talk about faces. Working out how somebody feels is really complicated because often what we see isn't what's happening inside. You might think about how these people are feeling. Or imagine if you just had the face and not the rest of the I've kicked a goal face, but just the face, angry, hostile, aggressive. He's not, he's delighted. He's feeling excited. He's kicked the winning goal. If we just had the face, sad, miserable, unhappy. These three young women apparently couldn't be happier. This is what joy looks like when you're at a concert. Emotions are tricky, which is why we all have to be more like detectives than judges when it comes to our students. And this matters greatly because emotions are literally the gatekeepers of how we process information, cognition, where we choose to place our energy and time, what motivates us to do what we do, and where our most limited resource goes, our attention. So think about that for students. Their emotions matter because it is controlling how they think, how they are motivated, and how they attend. Let's do a little bit of backgrounder. Before COVID, so let's go back, could you believe that, two years ago, there was a global demand for cell back then. Depression was ranked by the World Health Organization as the number one disability in the world. Literally disabling people from earning incomes, contributing to society and living their best life. It disabled people, mental health issues. A growing cost to individuals and communities and for students themselves, a major issue, steadily increasing across the globe. One in five students um, experiencing a mental disorder, 20% of adolescents in the United Kingdom, 50% of lifelong mental health issues established by age 14, and 75% of lifelong mental health issues, 75% um, by age 24. 10% of students are clinically diagnosable with their conditions, but 70% have not had any early intervention or identification. There's a huge number of benefits for schools to invest time in creating spaces and places to develop social and emotional skills. You can reduce that depression. You can improve academic achievement. You can improve the skills they need for work and life you can get better behavior. And there are examples across the globe where schools and entire systems have achieved these benefits. That education attainment one, it lasts. Students with a cell focus on one study, an extended study, 13 points higher than those who didn't. But interestingly, it lasted for three and a half years. A famous study done in the UK they tracked students for from the 1970s. They tracked them for 40 years, the Perry study, and they found a host of benefits for a focus on social and emotional learning. And if you're into, which we all are, the sustainable development goals, you can't achieve those, especially goal 4.7, which is uh, educating for sustainability. These goals are in conflict with one another, many of them. You say no palm oil there, you're going to destroy the income and social structure of a community that depends upon it over there. To achieve sustainable development goals, we need young people 
to be able to navigate complex, responsible decision-making, to negotiate, to compromise, to have empathy, to be able to engage in fierce conversations and wrestle solutions. To achieve the sustainable development goals, we need every learner in every classroom in the globe developing social and emotional skills because these goals, make no mistake, are many of them are in conflict with one another. And conflict management and resolution is a key outcome of developing social and emotional skills, developing that cohesion. But what about something really practical, like, can I get a job? That would be useful. I want to make a life and be happy. And earning an income isn't a bad thing uh, in order to do that. If we look at this is study from McKinsey and Company, what's changed? This is a study across Europe and the United States. We're seeing a reduction, obviously, in physical, manual, repetitive skills and basic cognitive skills, which are largely being outsourced to AI and automation. But what can't be outsourced? Those higher skills, creativity, flexible thinking, um, complex synthesis, all of the mucky human stuff. Social and emotional skills predicted to have a premium placed upon them for employability in the future. And obviously those technical skills for the digital economy. These are the new future ready skills. Our young people need these social and emotional skills. Without them, the technical skills can't be applied to do good. But what's missing right at the moment across the globe? We're missing a bunch of skills. We're missing. Well, basically, they're all social and emotional skills, the ability to problem solve, to be creative, to work with others, to deal and navigate with complexity, to communicate. So as a quick summary, a focus on cell does two things. It aims to maximise learner potential. It's not just about minimising issues downstream with mental health. That's part of it, but it's both of those pieces. And right now, we're out of COVID in many countries, in post-COVID, kids are more stressed, more overwhelmed than they were before. So this is latest research out in the last month. Students are actually suffering more. They're feeling more overwhelmed now that schools have reopened and they're expected to pick up and continue with life as usual. The trauma has continued. Quick thing about the brain, think of this as kids' brains. We are all built for stress. We all managed the stress over the last two years. It was terrible, but we're built to adapt with more neurons in the brain than there are stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Your brain is designed for adaptation and it's done that, but it hates feeling out of control. It's where stress becomes distress. Stress isn't bad. But if you've used up all of your available resources, you become distressed and the brain doesn't like that. And students need to constantly feel they're in control to be seen, to be heard, to have control. It's where technology can help give them a sense of control. So if emotions are the gatekeeper for these things, let's jump in skip those and let's jump straight into what will make students be successful and I'll, I'll go to 740 and then we'll pause for questions let's I'll, I'll jump around a little bit let's just say no more acts of random learning when it comes to social and emotional learning simply these five things kids need to develop the language to accurately label emotions they need um, opportunities to build and practice. They need opportunities to observe people and give feedback around how people navigate making a decision, resolving a conflict, joining a friendship group. They need opportunities to pause and reflect and they need opportunities for personal connections. If we just jump through some of those quickly and I'll just give some stat points and then we'll move around. The labelling is important. Why? Because kids learn about 5,000 words, new words a year, and only about 30% of those come from the classroom. 
So if we have to be able to name it to tame it, they need to be introduced to the language of emotions intentionally in the classroom. Make sure kids have opportunity to uh, practice expressing gratitude. It changes the way people see things. The grass is greener where you water it, not on the other side. The grass is greener where you water it. Gratitude shifts our attention away from the negative without ignoring it. It releases dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin. Gratitude, make no mistake, it's not warm and fluffy. It's a neurobiological phenomena. Make sure your kids have an opportunity to express forgiveness. It's a really important reframing strategy that shifts the focus from me to we. Mindfulness. It's moment to moment awareness. It will improve your attention. It will allow you to bounce back and reduce stress. Positive reframing is optimistic thinking. And curiously, volunteering will improve subjective well-being and it again reduces cortisol. It makes people feel they're connected to purpose. They can give back. Remember I said to be seen, to be heard, to have control and contribute. Students have to feel they can contribute back to the world. Educators have said they need to know a lot more about students, the complexities they face in and out of the classroom, their emotional state and their motivation. And let's jump into the technology piece. It's not a new phenomena. Um, World Economic Forum published New Vision for Education around social and emotional learning back in 2016. Um, and it called out a number of experiences which can be beneficial. I'd recommend you grab that research, track me down on Twitter. There's my handle in the bottom right-hand corner. Here's a couple of quick examples and then happy for questions. You're looking at Minecraft. This is Mindful Night. It was a free world built in Minecraft to teach students about mindfulness. And when we released it in February last year, it became one of the most downloaded free worlds with all of the curriculum attached to it. It taught students about mindful breathing, mindful reflection, they engage in journaling. It gives them voice and choice and agency and a sense of control and it builds their skills and their vocabulary. So Mindful Night, a medieval quest for mindfulness. How do we solve conflict to get ready for these sustainable development goals? Working with the Nobel Prize Foundation, we built and released another free world called Peace Builders, which allows students to literally engage in working together to solve global challenges and learn from global leaders who have navigated peace in our society. Here's an example where technology has moved from photocopiers to interactive whiteboards to deeply immersive human experiences that build skills, but importantly, build dispositions to do good, to contribute, to take control. These cute little feeling monsters are all around. I'm happy to share this. I made this resource in PowerPoint, by the way, for my daughter. Um, to allow her students to drag and drop emotions by energy and by pleasant, unpleasant, just like we did earlier. If you wanted to, we've built out a free game in Kahoot for anybody to play. They can scan the QR code and they can find out about managing change, dealing with stress, anger management, expressing gratitude, completely free. Similarly, sitting in Microsoft Teams, completely free, is a tool which allows whole classes to do emotion check-ins. And you can look at your class just like you can see on the screen. You can see all of the emotions self-reported by your students or by your staff. Again, it sits in Microsoft Teams, not a shameless commercial break for them, but it is completely free um, and is amazing. Flip is also free. And my good buddy Andy did a, ran a session last night. What's interesting about Flip is 8 billion videos uploaded. It's not like TikTok. Only teachers can create the platform. Totally secure, totally safe. At the moment, we've got about 14,000 years of student voice 
sitting in flip. Think about that across 190 countries with the cute feeling monsters in there, totally free. And flip can be used for daily check-in, self-reflection, stress relief, for enjoying learning. Immersive reader is built into it, 160 languages, reading back to the student, inclusive, available for everybody. Need so what I'm gonna do is jump to the end bit. Oh, this is cute. Just use emojis on a keyboard, easy. But I'm aware of the time. You can find out a lot more about all of those tools, aka.ms forward slash SEL. That's Microsoft's social and emotional learning uh, landing page. It has everything you need to know about Reflect, about Minecraft, about free tools that you can use Monday, not someday, to give every student the best seat in the house and to give every student voice and choice and control over their learning. Of course, shamelessly follow me on Twitter. I like to build my professional learning network and also steal your good ideas and share them with other people. That's important. And I'm gonna pass over to our fine moderator now, should we have any really hard questions that I'll struggle with. So back to you in the studio. So much more. I think um, our audience are really, they're all quiet, which is unnatural for some of our T4 audience. But <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for your session today. I'm gonna look at some of the comments that has been posted in the chat. Um, Kirsten has said that teachers need the training and support to be e effective at achieving this. In all the time you've been working with this, what are some of the models or programs that you would recommend to teachers? Yes, this is a good question. And it's very much about context, depending upon the country, the community, yes. the capacity that the, the school, the individual has. I've dropped into the text chat. I think it's the correct link, the community that I run. That question comes up a lot. People asking, hey, I want to get started. What's a good, straightforward way? Um, the best place to ask is to crowdsource that from the community. I don't want to say, I think second step is great or Panorama or uh, Ruler from Yale is the best way. One thing we do know is that the research is really clear. Effective practices need to be whole school or whole system. They need to address adult social and emotional learning before the students. Um, then you can get that kind of kick on effect. And there's a number of, as I said, successful examples. But the answer to that question would be go to the Cell and Edu community, um, crowdsource a question. Somebody's mentioned Castle, really important, uh, the Collaborative for uh, Academic, Social and Emotional Learning. They have a great resource on their website, which has, I think, about 80 programs which are research based evidence credentialed and they've been approved they don't represent all of the potential cell programs on the planet but castle have certainly endorsed 80 of those uh, as having some of the hallmarks of quality thank you mark um that also i think may answer the question that Pushparani had with programs and theory being implemented in her school and if you have a question and you want to ask it out loud or raise your hand, feel free to do so, Pushpa. There's another question in the chat um, from Daniel, and he's asking, how can we build cell moments right into the curriculum? Yeah, and that's the big question that, that Daniel's asked. And it, it comes back to the comment I made before that. Where, where social and emotional learning practices are bolted on, they're problematic. When they're built in, they become effective. So, Daniel, uh, I mean, an example would be folding those uh, those pause moments, those emotion check-ins, maybe at transition points between maths and science, or straight after lunch, we have mindfulness. You know, we've been practicing that. We're going to do this after lunch break, or at the end of the day. You know, I'm a junior primary teacher. We're having a gratitude circle. And I've got my little five-year-olds and I'm saying, let's have, uh, you know, two roses and one leaf. You know, what are the two things you're grateful for today? What's something you're anticipating for tomorrow? So again, the kids go home instantly thinking that something good's going to happen tomorrow. 
we know that when we set anticipation in motion in kids' heads, their brain starts to scan for the goodness. Again, that's yes. why gratitude yeah. matters. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. I want, I have a, uh, I have a question. How do you bring parents in schools or organizations into this, um, education organizations into this um, concept? Okay. Again, it does come back to context. In the US, social and emotional learning, and some of my US colleagues in here may agree or disagree, it can be tricky depending on what state you're in because some people can see that agenda is aligned to a political agenda. So it comes back to context mm. with parents and communities. So in some countries, uh, I'll be talking a lot about skills for employability. It'll be social and emotional skills, but I'll be calling it skills for employability. In some parts of the US, I'll deliver a keynote around, let's talk about executive functioning and academic achievement. And everybody will go, yes. And then I'll talk about the importance of emotion regulation as a key feature of executive functioning. So my answer to the question would be, you need to understand your community, its triggers, what activates them, what their drivers are, and then map that back to an agenda. I like to say this, this isn't about smiley face stickers for everyone. There is nothing soft about soft skills. They're hard to teach, hard to learn, hard to assess. They're fundamental for success in learning, life and work. If you want your kids to be able to get a job and flourish in the future, these are fundamental and not ornamental. When you start framing it up with tough language and 30 years of research behind it, there are a few roadblocks. But if you approach it with I'm being facetious here, but if you approach it in that kind of warm, fuzzy, everybody gets a sticker and a smiley yeah. face shirt, yeah. I like you'll that. find at times you'll get opposition. Yes, and that makes sense. Thank you um, for that answer. Um, introducing it like that, people already think this is not going to work because you're approaching it in the wrong way. So thanks for that. What I would like to ask, normally would sell and, and, and managing staff and managing students and managers, managing learning communities. The leaders of the schools, if I must now think of schools, they're not always supported. How do you approach that when you go into schools or whatever audience you face when it comes to education? Sorry, are you saying that the leadership are not supportive or they're not supported? No, they, they're not always as supported. It's always the focus is supporting the students, supporting uh, the students. Yeah. yeah. Uh, right. So, again, that comes back to, I think, research, uh, again, which makes it very clear that leaders matter. And, you know, my brief touch on the emotion contagion effect is very clear. Teachers catch them from their leaders, leaders catch them upstream. You know, it's a kick on effect. Um, in order to be successful, you know, uh, leaders need to be well supported. They have an emotional toil, you know, having been one for a long time and meeting with leadership across the globe constantly, they are equally as stressed out and flat strapped as their teachers. They don't have enough teachers at the moment to fill their classrooms. Um, they can't take on another burden, another activity, another task, unless it clearly maps to their priorities. So again, if your priority is better behaved students, great, here's an approach. If, you're, yeah. if your need is students graduate, great, social and emotional learning. If your approach is, you know, we want our students to insert answer here, it's a matter again of coming back to building a case that uses the evidence to show people that this is fundamentally a part because at the end of the day, let's let's all say it as it is, learning is a social process. Yes. It always has been. It's something simply done best together. Um, and, you know, that is, that's the simple truth of our wonderful profession. Yes. Thank you, Mark. Um, we have a, about two minutes. What I would like to do now is anyone from the audience would like to give 
some input. Um, those people already busy working with Sal. I know Sandra is very passionate about it. I know Daniel here is doing a few projects. Um, if you would like to give any input just to share with our participants on your view and you know, adding on to what Mike has, uh, Mark has said, please feel free to raise your hand. And I would also like to give Mark an opportunity to just put your um, contacts and your details in the chat again for people to reach out to you. Yeah. Daniel, you have nothing to say, are you sure? <laughs> Sandra, you? Um, yeah, I, I, I just, this whole presentation has just been unbelievable. Like, I feel like I'm gonna cry because oh. it's so true. And it's, I see it in action. I'm not a teacher, but we have a nonprofit youth rock band program and it's very inclusive. And we're in a, um, we have, we're very inclusive. We're, you know, offering scholarship and, and kids with disability, but we're in a town that's very affluent and there's a lot of pressure on the kids to be perfect, to mm. achieve. And they are so disconnected from their true selves. They're never going to, the, the parent, the, the goal of the community is this success and the way the community, the culture is they're never going to achieve it because they're so disconnected from themselves. And at our program, we just tell the kids to come as they are, learn the way they are, be themselves. And the weird thing is that sometimes I think our community thinks of us as like misfits. But the truth of the matter is, is we're by having kids be in touch with their feelings, access kindness and love and compassion, they're going to be more successful. But I just love this so much. Thank you. Yeah, I, I love that comment about in those affluent settings. Um, a teacher came up to me at EduTech in Australia. I was doing a keynote six weeks ago, and he said to me that he taught in a prestigious girls' school, All, all Hallows, um, advanced calculus. And his girls had come in after lunch, and as they always do, all ready to learn. And he said, Mark, I decided I'd use that reflect tool and post it privately, ask the girls, well, how are you feeling right now? He said, I just did it as an experiment. He said, it blew me away. He said, I've been teaching 40 years. I've never asked that question. I had no idea. What I thought the girls were feeling was not what was happening. Anxious, stressed, expectations too high on them, um, friendship issues, all that stuff that we know happens. He never in his career had that insight until the technology actually surfaced up. And he, I said, what was the impact? He said, I instantly changed what I was doing. And I thought, whoa, that's the power here. When we give people voice, where we create a space, where we provide the skills and make it invitational, not instructional. You yes. know, when we invite people in, that's at the heart of what inclusion means. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. This was an amazing session. And I would like to just in summary say, you have made it so real because I think everywhere in schools, in organizations, um, just going out socially, it's like people have lost touch with their emotions. And you have just presented so many resources and ways and strategies for our students and adults, whoever, to get in touch with that again, using technology, bringing that into the equation as well. So we want to thank you for this time you have spent. It, it was amazing. And I think one thing I would like to say, you have even silenced Kirsten. Kirsten <laughs> <laughs> right. was quiet. <laughs> is, that, is that a thing? <laughs> no, she is just so passionate about um, inclusive learning. And um, it's just, um, I know she's enjoyed the session and I just, I just, I just, I'm just teasing her anyway. So yeah. Jasmine, Jasmine sorry Thank to interrupt. So I, just yeah. saw Dan, I saw Daniel actually has got his hand up. Yeah. Maybe we could just hear from Daniel quickly. Go on, Daniel, you're on mute, you're on mute. Yep, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm, I don't use Zoom a lot on my phone, so. All right, yeah, um, me too. Yeah, uh, so th this was a phenomenal session. And uh, Mark, you you'd mentioned um, giving students the voice. And I think another big part of, of SEL is also giving them choice. So I think, um, you know, making them authors of their own learning. 
and, and um, active participants in the planning of a classroom, the, um, the, um, the, the day to day um, check ins, you know, what ideas do they have to check in with each other. Um, and just a real quick, simple activity that I usually do, um, you can do it high tech or low tech, um, is it, just an, an SEL check in um, to kind of get the temperature of the room. And I, I do it in Nearpod where I have people just draw on a little emoji. Um, but you can also do it with post-its and just um, as they enter the classroom, how are you feeling? Or write a word about your day or what do you want to learn today? Um, and then it just gives you that information and you don't, you don't need to necessarily dwell on it, but then the whole class gets a snapshot of how people are feeling. So they know there might be three people that are feeling sad or tired or yeah. really excited or happy. So I think just that snapshot is, is always vital. Yeah, no, that's great. I love that comment about that, uh, you know, that agency bit, because again, that's the, you know, that's the output. Giving voice and choice is great. Agency is about that being placed in a position where you feel you're invited and you have the skills to contribute to make a difference. And I like your comment about, you know, the post-it notes, low tech, high tech, you know, one of the benefits of the reflect tool is also students can see anonymized data for how everybody else has checked in and that can help them get a sense of moderation of okay there's a lot of people feeling low energy it's not just me um and that's a positive thing so thanks for your comments daniel thank you so much We've come to the end of our session and we thank all of you for coming today and hopefully we'll see you again mark in a future session it's been thank great so again uh make sure you uh sort of do a little shout out on twitter if you're on twitter and join the Cell and Edu community love to continue the conversation. Thanks, Jasmine, and thanks, Mike, for helping facilitate this. Thank you so much. Okay, and we'll share the slides with you because Mark said that's perfectly fine. So thank yeah. you. Okay.